church, and I'm here to present the Word of the Week devotion this week. It is faithfulness. And this was quite a challenge for me to prepare, not because it's a difficult subject, but because the Scripture says so much about faithfulness in many different aspects. It was difficult to distill down a, a reasonably short message to talk to you about faithfulness. So, in starting, I want to open up in prayer today and, and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to present your word to your people. I pray that you'd open up hearts to receive, that they would understand the essence of your faithfulness in all things and your requirement of us to be faithful with all things that you reveal. I pray, Lord, today that this message would glorify you with truth, with completeness, with honor that you deserve. And again, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, your people would receive be fed and nourished and encouraged to walk in faithfulness to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does it mean to be faithful? Faithfulness is a quality. It displays the character of an individual and demonstrates their commitment to a vow, to keep a promise no matter the circumstances or the cost. In that regard, God's faithfulness is perfect in all ways. It's his guarantee that he will always be true to himself, his creation, and his promises. Now, as we've studied other attributes of God, I'm going to say again, in studying any attribute, the essential oneness or unity of all his attributes quickly proves itself. For instance, if God possesses power, being infinite, he must possess all power. Hence, he must be omnipotent. If he possesses any knowledge, being infinite, he must know everything there is to know, and hence be omniscient. If he's unchangeable, he's always the same. Therefore, he couldn't be unfaithful because that would require him to actually change and be faithful at some times and unfaithful at others. And, and in fact, if there's any failure in any divine character, it would argue against God's perfection. All that God does must agree with all that God is. Being and doing are one with him. And he's equally faithful in dispensing mercy and judgment. He's not torn between the two like you or I might be. To think of him as such, torn between the two, in the way some religions present him, it's, it's an erroneous, weak mental image that is badly out of focus about God. God's every thought Every word and every act must align with his wisdom, goodness, justice, holiness, love, truth, and all his other attributes. If they do not or did not, he would not be considered faithful. Now, Scripture, as I said, preparing this message, it, it took me hours to distill down all of the concepts of faithfulness that are presented in Scripture. But Scripture throughout declares God's faithfulness. Man, men are drawn to be unfaithful out of desire, out of fear, out of weakness, or some strong external influence. But God's character and God himself, not subject to any external influence, he is his own reason for all he is and does, and he's true to his own nature in all things. 
And you have to understand that almost every heresy in the church and doctrine through the years, it's arisen either from believing something about God that is patently false or from an overemphasis of one truth about God to the exclusion or ignoring of another truth that throws the truths out of balance. And, and like I said, teaching about God's love and that it would never permit him to condemn anyone to hell when the truth of his righteous justice demands that he punish sin, that would be an error. Both things are true because scripture tells us that they're true. And we can only hold a correct view of God's character by believing without reservation everything that he has revealed about himself. It's dangerous to diminish or exclude acceptance of any attribute that our ignorance deems objectionable to our own values or perceptions. That is a critical idea. We often try to apply our own values in judging God's behaviors or principles. And we cannot do that. It's an error to do so. As John the Baptist said in, in John Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. Well, he's speaking of Christ there and the fact that Christ is revealing himself. But the truth is that we are nothing and God is everything. And the only reason we are anything is because he declares us to be so. It's not intrinsic in our own character because of the fall of Adam and Eve passed down to us. Now, there is a double-edged balance in the truths of Scripture. We see it in Deuteronomy 7, verses 9 to 11. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So one of, one of the first aspects that we see about faithfulness is that it keeps covenants. When it makes vows, it keeps the vows, or he. And then follows, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. There's the balance. He blesses those who love him, and he brings his wrath. He repays those that hate him, and he does it to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So we see Moses challenging the people. God is faithful to keep his covenant with you, you need to be faithful in return to keep your vows to him. God's faithfulness is proclaimed in the Psalms. Psalm 40, verse 10. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I've declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I've not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. As we experience God's faithfulness to us, it emboldens us, it empowers us to tell others about it. Where David talks about not hiding righteousness within his heart, we hide the word of God in our heart for sure that we might not sin against him. But when we experience the faithfulness of God, we have to proclaim it. We have to shout it out. Psalm 89, 1 to 2. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. And so... 
we may not have experienced God's faithfulness to past generations, but the, the scripture records it for us. And we have yet to experience his faithfulness to future generations, but by the word of his testimony, we know that his faithfulness stretches from the earth into the heavens and will be declared and is declared even today in the congregation of the saints around the throne who've experienced the salvation that was promised to them long before they passed. Psalm 119.75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. And affliction is something we try to avoid at all costs. It is part of our nature to resist suffering and to sense that suffering means that something's wrong. But God in his faithfulness will afflict those whom he is growing, who he is conforming to the likeness of his son, who was shown to be righteous in affliction. And we we have to understand God's purpose for affliction is not necessarily punishment or evil, but it can be used for our good when he administers it correctly and with mercy. In Psalm 143, 1 to 2, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. So God will be faithful to respond to us one way or another as we're putting our supplications before him, as we're crying out to him, as we are worshiping him with adoration, as we're confessing our own shortcomings and understanding He's the one who makes us righteous, but we will not be made righteous by our own efforts. God's faithfulness is declared and confirmed in Isaiah 25, 1. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. The counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. This faithfulness is not something new, and it's not just for today. God was faithful before creation, and he will be faithful long after this creation passes through the fire and the new heaven and the new earth come down. Isaiah 49, 7 to 10, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers. And, and this, I believe, this is being said to the Lord Jesus Christ. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel. And he shall choose thee, thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant to the people, to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, <laughs> that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For the, he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. We're seeing that God is faithful even to his son to accomplish the things that he sent him to do. 
the one that man despiseth and the nations abhorreth, a servant of rulers. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he's given an acceptable time for the day of salvation to help and preserve. God's faithfulness demonstrated in Hosea 2, 19 to 20. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindnesses and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. Now this is the vow of the husband to the bride. For God, he's betrothed to Israel. For Christ, betrothed to the church. The husband, faithful, even when the betrothed is unfaithful. It's the example for us to know and have courage and confidence that our husband will always be faithful to us. And this faithfulness is exemplified throughout Scripture in God's promises. Hebrews 10, 22 to 23. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience so that even our conscience can't bind us back from the promises of God and keep us from trusting in them. And our bodies washed with pure water, the water welling up to life from the Holy Spirit. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. In Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised not depending on the promises of man or the abilities of man. In John chapter 1, the gospel, it says, children born not of natural decision or, or human consent or a husband's will, but born of God. In God's calling, faithfulness is exemplified. 1 Corinthians 1, 4-9, I thank my God always on your behalf. For the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye, be in, ye are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Many are called, but few are chosen. But the call always comes from the Spirit of God. And if you have answered, he is faithful. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, not just a little bit, all the way. Perfectly righteous, cleansed of all sin by the blood of Christ. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. The caller is the one who performs the task. All we have to do is to respond and let him do his work. And of course, faithfulness is in God himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And, and as I opened this devotion, I said, God he is compelled to and constrained by his own nature to be all that he is in its entirety, its infinity, its eternality, and its perfection. 
he cannot deny himself. He's professed it, and he will be it. 1 John 1, 9, how does it work itself out? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pardon me. It's exemplified in Christ as high priest, Hebrews 2.17 and chapter 3, 1 to 3. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. The high priest in the Old Testament was nothing more than an image of the perfect high priest who was to come. They were to represent the people to God one time a year on the Day of Atonement in the most holy place. Daily through the sacrifices for the sins of the day, but once a year to make reconciliation for himself and the sins of the people. In chapter 3, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. God the Father appointed him to be high priest. As also Moses was faithful, in all his house. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house itself. And so Christ the high priest, the builder of the house, the creator of life, the sustainer of life, worthy of more honor and faithful, more faithful even than Moses who failed God by striking the rock in the desert that God told him to speak to and was thus excluded from entering into the promised land after all of his years of faithfulness. He had to go up on the hill. He had to die looking into the promised land that the people could cross over exactly the way Christ went up on the hill and died on the cross, looking in to the promised land, as Hebrews 12 puts it, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God's faithfulness exemplified in Christ as Alpha and Omega. Revelation 1, five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. True witness, faithful witness that resurrection is real. He was the first and we will follow. Revelation 3.14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the end of all things, the Omega, the faithful and true witness again, the beginning of the creation of God. So in that verse, we see the Amen, the Omega, and the creation, the Alpha. Revelation 19.11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There's your balance. There will be resurrection, but there will also be wrath and warfare. And that white horse represents purity. So God's faithfulness is applied in many ways. I'm going to cover just a couple of them here. Applied to redemption. God brought his people out of Egypt with an outstretched arm. Deuteronomy 
26, 7 to 9. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And if you believe the scripture and you believe the prophecies, you will know that God is going to bring us out of captivity with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and wonders and take us into the place even a land that flows with milk and honey. God redeemed his people from Babylon. Ezra 1, 1 to 3. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And here, here's a calling now to the people through Cyrus, who's not Jewish, he's a Gentile. And he's saying, who, who is there among you of all his people who's willing to go? That same call's going out to us today. Who is there among all the people in this nation, in this city, even in this church, who may not yet believe in the world. Who is there among you? Let God be with you. Are you willing to go up? Are you willing to allow your body to become the temple of the Holy Spirit and to be built into a body of believers, added in with your special abilities, with your special calling? with your special love and the special love that God has for you. Are you willing to build the house? And in redemption, we see it over and over. I'm just bringing these up so you can see. It's not a single instance, but it's repeated. God redeemed his people from exile. It was prophesied in Isaiah 66, 20, but it happened prior to the lives of most of us, and we have seen the results of it. In 1948, they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain in Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. The children are back. Nobody thought it possible. Dispersed by the Romans in the late first century and early second century, 1900 years away from the land, they came back. And they are yearning to build that house of the Lord, to bring in the offerings that are prophesied in Isaiah 66, 20. And those are all physical deliverances. But the most precious deliverance of God, the faithfulness and fulfilling his promise, is the deliverance from sin and death that we see in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, 1 Corinthians 1, 29 to 30, no flesh should glory in his presence, 
but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Romans 8, 22, 23. This reminds us of the frustration of the desire of our hearts to finally be made right, to be in his presence, to be freed from these bodies of death that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. And not only us, but all things in this created world. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We have the first fruit of the Spirit. He's an earnest. He's the down payment. He's the seal that God gave us to say, this is just the start, but count on it. I've made the down payment. You will be redeemed when the appropriate time comes. Until then, you have to occupy, and you will suffer. You will groan in these bodies because of their weakness, their frailty, their temptation, their proneness to illness and death and failure. Luke 21, 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, all of the, the prophetic signs and wonders that Christ talked about, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. While well, we should be looking up, the signs are, are being confirmed in the heavens with blood moons, on the earth with tornadoes and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and the wickedness increasing. Are you looking up? Are you excited about the soon redemption of your body? God's faithful. He's faithful in his promises. He's faithful in prophecy. Responding to God's call. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Listen to what he has to say. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And here's the balance. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And we're familiar with the promises. God promised the land. He promised to make him a father of many nations. And he promised that he would bless all peoples on earth through him. And certainly through the Messiah, that's become true. History proves God's faithfulness in fulfilling those promises. In some respects, I can hear God make the same promises to Jesus just before he departed heaven for the incarnation. I want you to leave. I want you to leave this heavenly country. I want you to leave these heavenly beings. I want you to leave the, the protection of this heavenly family with me and the Holy Spirit and go to a land that I showed you. And he makes the same call to each of us in a spiritual sense. Have we not had to leave members of our family behind? Have we not had to look for a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God and not consider the earth our real inheritance? God makes the same call. 
Now, in a different context, Deuteronomy sets forth conditions for blessings and cursings for Israel. Read Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to about 52, 53. I'm not going to do that here. But he made conditional the blessings and cursings for Israel, and they've been repeatedly proven by their roller coaster history in Judges, Kings, Chronicles, and throughout Scripture. You can read those yourself. In the future, God's faithfulness to his promises reveals hope for us versus the terror of Judgment Day for those who have rejected his Son. He promises deliverance for anyone humble enough to admit their sinfulness and call on his grace to forgive them on the basis of Christ's work of atonement. But alternatively, he promises to banish from heaven all who love sin and reject his son. In his word, God is warned and threatened, and he will be faithful to bring it to pass. Let no one, no one, do not trust in a desperate hope or religion that differs from what God has promised and the conditions that he has set. By grace, he has postponed judgment to give us all opportunity to repent and be saved. But remember, there was a day for Noah's world when Noah entered the ark. There was a day for Sodom and Gomorrah when Lot left. There was a day for northern Israel when the Assyrians came. There was a day for Judah when the Babylonians came. And there will be a day for Antichrist and the wrath of God to bring judgment upon the wicked of this world. So while God may move slowly in our perspective, his patience will end and judgment will come. So let's have courage in all things. Isaiah 41.10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So, don't fear. There are those who hate Christ. There are those who hate God. And Jesus says, do not be surprised if the world hates you because it hated me first. But have courage. God knows how to save the godly. He knows how to bring you through trials and tribulations. At the same time, have confidence in God's mercy. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Today's challenges, he is faithful to sustain you through them. Tomorrow's challenges, he will still be faithful. Yesterday's challenges are behind you. And if you are honest with yourself and look, you will see that he's brought you through many of them faithfully. And you've learned from them. God's faithful to his prophecies. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the most compelling proofs that scripture is God's word. Only God with perfect omniscience existing from eternity past into eternity future, outside of time. Only he can reveal with perfect accuracy things that are yet to come. Scripture is the only sacred writing that without error 
publishes future accounts of people and actions, many of which have already been fulfilled and can be confirmed, and many more which we are on the cusp of seeing fulfilled even now. The significance of God's faithfulness to the believer. You can live on superstition. You can live on supposition, on false doctrine, and erroneous thoughts about God while everything is going well. But when trials, tribulations, and persecution comes, you better know and understand and trust the God of creation that you say you believe in. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 12, verse 12 on the screen. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given in us in Christ before the world began. That's that faithfulness from the very beginning. And faithful to see it through to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and ultimately to the second coming of Christ but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, first advent, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we're still looking for that immortality and the redemption of our bodies, but the light has shined on it and we have understood it and believed in it. Whereunto I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. And here it is, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day of judgment, that day. And so, the faithful God values our faithfulness. Psalm 31, 23 to 24. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Countered with 1 Peter 4, 16 and 19, Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The wheat and the tares have to be separated. It's harvest time. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The tempted, the anxious, the fearful, the discouraged may all find new hope and good cheer in the knowledge that our Heavenly Father is faithful. 
last verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 10. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. God will ever be true to his pledged word as his sons and sons of his covenants we may be sure he will never forsake us in our trials hold back his loving kindnesses nor fail to fulfill his promises to us withdraw your hope from an ever-changing treacherous unsatisfying world and place it in Jesus Christ.